You know, Frank Snepp uh, told me the other day that uh, the CIA was only interested in the good, established, liberal reporters, and that you're, you were one of the targets, I believe is the word he used. I, I'm, I suppose I should be flattered to be considered one of those good, liberal, solid uh, reporters, but I'm not very flattered that, uh, that, uh, that I was a target. As a matter of fact, I didn't talk to Snap too much. During most of the war, uh, uh, I saw other people. At a higher level? At a much higher level than Snap, and sometimes at a lower level than Snap. Snap has sort of set himself up. He's gotten a lot of, of uh, publicity mileage out of this business, of, 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 uh, out of this claim that he fed certain correspondents uh, disinformation. He's gotten entirely too much credit uh, for it, because my God, when I first met Snip out at the Circus Sportif in Saigon, and he, he, wanted, he was trying to get a job with Newsweek at the time. This was during his first tour. And he was flexing, flexing his muscles for the lovely Vietnamese girls out there, and he's a good looking guy. But I thought to myself, I said, the CIA is hiring some pretty flaky people these days. First uh, impression. Guys, uh I, I, I think you might agree with me that among us in World War yeah, II yeah, and uh, yeah. among the Correspondents Corps, there's a lot of rivalry, a lot of competition, sure. healthy competition, yeah. and every once in a while there's a little, uh, the rivalry gets almost antagonistic. Oh, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, I recall a, was going in somewhere, well, we were going into Lady, and I applied to the PIO to go with MacArthur. No one else had thought of it, and all of a sudden, you know, I was sure. regarded as, as, as a very mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sneaky sort of person because I didn't get up and announce that I was going to ask for that. There was only one spot on the ship, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, by the way, we drew lots and I lost. Oh. <laughs> Bill Dunn of CBS got the, the lucky straw. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I see this surfacing every once in a while. I, I heard Morley Safer at CBS the other night take a crack at you. You remember what he said? Uh, yes, I think he caused, uh, roughly, I was so mad, I wasn't exactly taking notes, but he said, uh, he read from a letter I'd written to Encounter Magazine, and, and he said that I was a, uh, a hack who accepted uh, army handouts or something like that. It was rather unflattering. And your reaction to that is, well, it was? My, my reaction to that is, first of all, is that Marley Safer, is one of the most expert hitmen and character assassins in t TV journalism. That is my editorial comment. The reason I think that my, what I said in that letter uh, so offended Morley was I described uh, a junior colleague who three or four years ago was denouncing the Vietnamese communists. This was in Thailand. And I said, now wait a minute, you, whatever happened to the flaming revolutionary I knew in Saigon, at that time you felt quite differently. And he said, ah, but that was before I had served in two socialist countries, uh -huh. Cuba and China. And that's, that passage in the letter seemed to infuriate Morley because it implied apparently, to, or he inferred from it, that he was supposed to repent too. And I think that Morley uh, uh, felt challenged or threatened by that statement. That's, that I don't know, that is speculation. I gotta sit forward a little bit here. Let's see, where are we going? Oh, let's talk about the, uh, about the free press. Goodness knows that you're a pillar of the free press if you, that doesn't seem an overwhelming statement to you. Uh, do you think that uh, the free press in a democracy has made it impossible for the, the government of the United States to ever sell another war like uh, Vietnam to the American people? Well, at first, I don't think that we will ever, uh, that anybody could sell another Vietnam to the American people under any circumstances. I don't think that, uh, Wars are sold, uh, uh, but to get down to can be sold, maybe for a little while. 
this was a very, very undersold war of Vietnam. And the reason for this, and this is one thing that's emerged from this conference, the reason that Lyndon Johnson didn't do more, there was a case, I think, to be made for the Vietnam War, but the Johnson administration did not make that case. And Lyndon Johnson himself did not want to make it because he wanted to sneak us in there and sneak us out. Now, that may sound a little strange, but uh, so uh, almost as, if you can imagine, sneaking a half a million troops into a country and sneaking them out uh, uh, without causing some public uh, commotion. But in any case, uh, I think that in the, I think it's going to make it difficult in, in future. Uh, if we get into a war, let's suppose that it might be considered a just war. Many people consider, and it's certainly a case to be made for it, that Vietnam was a very unjust war. Uh, let's suppose that we got into a just war. Uh, and and uh, I have heard some TV correspondents who were in Vietnam say that it would be impossible for the United States to fight another war. Uh, uh, and maintained an open society such as we had in Vietnam with all the TV crews uh, leaning over the shoulder of the, of the troops and so forth. And I've said, well, my reaction to that was, well, okay, maybe you're right, but where does that leave us? Presumably our adversary is going to be someone, uh, the Soviet Union or one of its uh, uh, associates and so forth. They are not going to be terribly worried about whether NBC, ABC, and PBS and ABC get their uh, uh, photo opportunities and so forth. Uh, I don't. I don't think that we should paralyze ourselves in the name of a free press. One thing that has been forgotten, I think, in all this uh, debate, is that freedom carries with it responsibility, and that responsibility. That responsibility is something, it is, is something that has been lacking in most of the debate that I've heard on this subject. When you were, as a World War II correspondent, when you looked at the younger correspondents there in Vietnam, mm -hmm. did you ever question your mind at any time, a serious question about their patriotism? Did the military ever have that question about them? That's a two-part question. Yeah. Well, did I ever have it mm -hmm. about their patriotism? No, I didn't really. I didn't really have any question about their their patriotism. I certainly uh, had some questions about their judgment, uh, uh, but uh, they were they were nice guys. They were good correspondents, um, and had I been of their generation, coming from their background, going to my first war in a m miserable, rather hostile environment such as Vietnam. I probably would have reacted no differently from the way they did. But I'd seen it all before, in one form or another, you see. So I wasn't, I, now, the second part of your question. The military, the did they? Yes, the military does. There is a deep resentment, and I would, hatred is perhaps too strong a word, but I think it does exist toward the media in general. In the military today? You think? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It is very definitely. It's a legacy of Vietnam. It's going to be there. Lots of, uh, I have attended uh, seminars at uh, Carlisle Barracks with the War College up there, Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. And it comes through from these very bright young lieutenant colonels uh, and others who are captains, uh, who are junior officers uh, in, uh, in Vietnam. And I think that it also extends out to a great uh, segment of, of American people, of the American people in general, uh, a hostility toward the media and so forth. Now we'll go into the root causes of that. But um, this, there is a feeling among the media that, that, that they were, that they were, that there is a feeling am among the military men with whom I have talked that the media did do them in, that, that, that the media destroyed whatever support there might have been uh, for the war in the United States, or that the war was misrepresented. 
Or did you ever hear them say the war was lost because of the media? I don't think I've heard that precise quote, mm -hmm. no. I think that some people, some military men think that, but I'd think that the more, more intelligent ones do not think that. Can I pause a minute and let your bearer rest back here? Yeah, okay. Do you need anything more here? Just Whoa, just look at my, look, am I up? <laughs> Guys, uh, you and I, uh, I guess we last saw each other at Bikini at the atom bomb test, 1947. Did you go on to the Far East from there? Yes, I did shortly after. That same year, as a matter of fact, I went out to Tokyo. How long were you in the Far East? Altogether, 33 years. And did your perspective on American power out there and your perspective on the whole Far East change much in those 33 years? Yes. Well, insofar as America was concerned, when I went out there, we were at our most powerful, and, and our pre prestige was never greater. Uh, it was a great time, an intoxicating time, to be an American. I saw that American position and the perception of America gradually decline over the years until it took a precipitate drop uh, with, Viet with the Vietnam experience. But in the meantime, of course, Asia was changing too. Asia was emerging. Japan was, was, was building up for its great economic miracle. And Korea, South Korea was emerging as a major uh, industrial power. Uh, and so were other such places as Hong Kong and, and Singapore, Taiwan. Are you all right? I don't have a final question. Final statement, uh, I've asked him, let me see, let's see if I have to bridge my mind up here. Or something. Well, I, I'll, I'll ask the question I haven't asked anyone else, you know. Well, Kai's is, is a... a the public got smarter. I, I think I've asked that. Do you, do you think the public's gotten smarter as a result of Vietnam? Do you think that it's more difficult to hoodwink the, the public today? Oh, I don't think so necessarily. I don't think the public is any smarter, uh, really. I, I, I doubt that. There's, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said that, that it, if there's anything we learn from experience, it is that we don't learn anything from experience. So I'd say it's a moot question. Guys, you and I were together at the Bikini Atom Bomb Test. That was 46, 47, wasn't it? 47. Yeah, yeah. 47. Mm -hmm. How long were you out in the Far East? Precisely 33 years. Your uh, perspective changed in those 33 years? You see things differently than you did when you began? Yes, immensely. I saw, when I first went to Asia, to Tokyo in 1947, uh, and for several years after that, American power and prestige uh, were never higher. Uh, that was a great post-war peak, of course. and. Perhaps it was dangerously high, but what I've seen since has been a gradual decline culminating in Vietnam, which was a, marked a precipitate drop in our world image. When did you first go to Vietnam? 1954, during the, during the last of the French Indochina War at the time of Dinh Binh Phu. Yeah, we were both out there at the same time, too. I recall when those French Foreign Legion troopers were brought from Algeria, wasn't it? Around into uh, Bangkok and into Saigon, was it? Or Hanoi? Huh? I'm not sure exactly where they were brought from, but they were brought there, yeah, yes. I mm -hmm. saw them come through Don Mook. Mm -hmm. um, your period in Vietnam covering the war covered what span of time? Well, which war? The French well, war? The French or, war, but I'm well, particularly uh, interested yeah. in the American war. Well, of course. Well, I was, I was in and out of Vietnam during the 1950s. I was there. I commuted between Tokyo and Saigon during the early 60s. Uh, in 1965, I took up residence there. I stayed until 1971 in residence. Then I came back from time to time. I was back there for the end. You know, talking with uh, other correspondents who covered it, one gets the impression it was 
it was a painful experience in a way for, for many of them. There was an adversary relationship with the military that seemed to bother them very, very much, bothers them today. Did you have that experience? Uh, not as, not as uh, much, not to the extent that they did. Uh, I found myself, because of my age uh, more than anything else, in the awkward position for once of being on the side of the establishment or appearing to be on the side of the establishment. I wasn't always, but uh, I think one thing has been overlooked about the adversary relationship between the press and the military there was that most of the correspondents, the majority of the correspondents, uh, were young enough to be the sons of the men who were running the war or conducting American policy there. So this was a generational thing. The, uh David Halberstam has told me that uh, there was a real division between the World War II correspondent, those of our era, and those younger correspondents, that, that communication between them uh, was uh, pretty difficult, was somewhat difficult. I think that that was true. I knew Dave and uh, Halberstam, Neil Sheehan, Mal Brown, some of the others, and uh, I think, I suspect that they, they thought that some of us were patronizing because we had covered other wars. We knew that war was held before we got to, to Vietnam and all of that. Uh, I was trying to convince them that, uh, uh, well, Dave and Neil used to tell me that, uh, that Zim had to go if we were going to get anywhere, if we were going to win the war. Well, I was, as I think I told them at the time, I was writing nasty stories about no Den Zim before, while they were still at Harvard. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I didn't share their view that Zim had to go. I, I, I said that if, any, if I'd learned anything uh, in my years in Asia, it was that you don't start overthrowing a government until you're pretty sure you've got something better in the wings to take its place. And we didn't have anything. Well, I mentioned that as an example mm -hmm. of, of the kind of disagreement that we had. I think that we all are products of our environment. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, I was, in a sense, an anomaly uh, there, uh, an, an, or rather an anachronism, not an anomaly, excuse me. Uh, I was an anachronism because I was of the World War II generation. And there were so very few of us. I mean, really, there were, I was, I, I was the only one, to my knowledge, who stayed the, stayed the course, as it were. Mm -hmm. Was there a time and if there was, when did it occur when you began to sense defeat or as someone has uh, said to me that uh, it uh, just wasn't working for us out there? Well, obviously, uh, uh, Tet was a turning point in the war. I wrote at the time that Tet, and I didn't have to write this, nobody asked me to write it. I wrote at the time that Tet could be the turning point of the war in favor of the Americans and their Vietnamese allies. And some people, some of my younger colleagues screamed bloody murder that I should write that thing, particularly when I said such a thing. But what I could see was that we had survived Tet. The, the, most of the VC had, Viet Cong had been destroyed and uh, this was such a terrific jolt that if the South could survive it and our military could survive it, that then we would have made a step toward winning the war. Of course, what happened was it took the United States out of the war politically. Uh, but that was, of course, a, a great, uh, uh, that was when I began to feel that the enemy was uh, the other side, as we later came to call it, was much uh, more resilient uh, than, uh, than we had given him credit for being. Mm -hmm. I think that we were winning the war uh, up to that point, which is why we had Tet, mm -hmm. because they felt that they had to do something. What do you recall, guys, about the mechanics of covering the war in, in uh, Vietnam, about transportation, getting to the areas of combat, getting back to Saigon, what was it like? Well, it was easy. Uh, one of the uh, things that 
that uh, that I we, we, we were we were given all kinds of transportation. It's the only war I know of uh, where uh, you could be get an American helicopter to fly you out to where the combat was in the morning, get get your story, have be picked up the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, the service couldn't have been better in that sense. Uh, and then you could sit down and write your story. You could vilify the Americans, or you could say they fought a good fight, or you could do whatever you wanted to. Um, uh, I, the, the press, generally, uh, many of them accused the military of lying to them. Whether there were direct lies, I think there were very few of those, but at, at military briefings, as anyone who's covered a war before, military briefings back at the rear have very little relationship to what actually happened up front. Mm -hmm. And of course, this outraged the guys who had been up front. Well, to me, there was, there was nothing new about it. Uh, ever since people, ever since armies went to war with, with journalists, there's been an adversary relationship. This just happened to be noisier than most. Antagonistic at times? Oh, bitterly antagonistic. I think that the correspondents very often, some of them, not all, but some of the younger correspondents deliberately baited, took an absolute delight in baiting the military, as though they were uh, taking a delight in baiting or being defiant of their fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the counterculture types would go around with their fingernails dirty and their long, with long greasy hair, looking unwashed and sloppy because they knew it would infuriate those crew-cut, clean-cut American generals and colonels. I'm convinced of that was true. Guys, did you have much to do with the CIA out there in Vietnam? Uh, not only in Vietnam, but uh, during the 30-odd years that I was in Asia, I knew CIA men all over Asia, yeah. yes. Uh, I've talked to some of them uh, here who told me that uh, they were feeding occasionally what they called disinformation to the to some of the correspondents out there. They said that uh, sometimes they feed them a little, uh, a few good stories, and they'd feed them something that they wanted to get published. And they were, you know, quote, uh, I, this is my word, using yeah. correspondents all the time. Well, yeah, I think Frank specifically uh, mentioned guys, didn't he? Is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah Frank Snap. Did you know him? Oh, I knew him quite well okay, there. Fine, yeah. sure, okay, fine. Did, did he say he fed me disinformation? Yes. Yeah, so. Well, that son of a... Well, Wait, a not, <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do it on <laughs> He mentioned your name, and he mentioned Bob Shaplin's name. Do you, you think he used you like that? Uh, I just shook hands with Frank this morning, and he said, I thought we... I hope that we have made up now. And I said, okay, but now, in view of what you've just told me, I take it all back. I'll see Frank probably in Washington when I get back. And so we'll be adversaries again. But let me tell you how Frank Snap used me. On or about April 13th, 1975, about two weeks before Saigon fell, I sat in Frank Snap's apartment on a Sunday afternoon in Saigon, and he laid out to me in detail how the communists, how the North Vietnamese army was going to come in and take Saigon. He said that they were going to uh, come in and take the place. They weren't interested in a coalition government or any political cosmetics or anything of that kind. They were coming in total military victory. And he described how they were going to do it, and he described it. His, his information was absolutely uncannily accurate. Now. On the basis of that briefing by Frank Snepp, and the I wrote a story which appeared in the Chicago Daily News on April the 14th, saying that this was what was going to happen, and it turned out to be, turned out to happen exactly that way. And as I remarked to Frank Snepp four or five years ago on a TV program elsewhere, I said, that's the kind of disinformation I like. Mm -hmm. Now. The CIA was only one of many sources that a correspondent uses. Uh, I had some very good sources in CIA, but no, rep no good reporter, uh, just as no good intelligence officer, is ever a captive of a single source. Mm -hmm. 
there are times when you, there are exceptions to that generalization, but most of the time you can check or cross check. Hey, you have any recollection of any bad information that uh, Frank or any else, anyone else in CIA gave you? Well, Frank was one of the people I saw less of than, than others. Mm -hmm. I usually dealt with a, on a, with a higher level. Frank was not very high up. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to dismiss him. But he was a good analyst, as a matter of fact. And he wrote a, a rather good book. Aside from the fact it contained a number of factual errors, the thrust of the book was, was a decent interval, was, was good. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I'm, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know of a single instance where I was fed disinformation. Now, disinformation is is a very very sinister term. You see, it's much worse than misinformation. Of course, misinformation means that somebody unwittingly uh, gave you bad, bad, bad dope. Whereas disinformation means that uh, you are being used as a sucker for, that you are being deliberately given false information. And it's fabricated information. Fabricated yeah. information. Yeah. I don't know, as I said the other day, it is possible that, that CIA used me in that respect. Mm -hmm. But I don't know when it happened, if it did happen. But the fact that I conceded that it was possible was what apparently got me into trouble. I was trying to be as honest as I sure, could about it. I understand. It. Mm -hmm. But all officials, Clay, you've been in this business a long time. Generals try to use you. The admirals try to use you. Ambassadors try to use you. And as I said last night, one of the great public relations coups of the war, the Vietnam War, was uh, when Hanoi decided to let Harrison Salisbury and and Tony Lewis, both of the New York Times, into North Vietnam in the middle of the war. Were they used? I asked that question of, of, uh, of Harrison, and he felt uh, he was had a legal visa to go in there, and he went in and did the story, was his point of view. Or did, yeah, okay, sure. I would, that might, might have been, did, but did you ask him if he, if he felt he was being used? I don't recall that I did. Maybe uh, I should have.